Today's guest on the podcast is Heather B. Armstrong. You all may know her as the founder of Deuce.com. She was one, if not the original mom blogger, starting her blog in 2001, I believe it was, hand coding it herself. And she took blogging to a whole new level. We talk about everything from motherhood to blogging to her new book called The Valedictorian of Being Dead, which is a chronicle of her lifelong battle with depression and how she went through an experimental treatment to cure it. I have to admit, I fangirled a little when she accepted my request to be on the podcast. (laughs) I have enjoyed following Heather for well over 10 years and um, just really appreciated her talking with me about things that are so real to so many of us. So I hope you all check out her book. The Valedictorian of Being Dead is available on April 23rd, and you can pre-order it now. Enjoy the episode with Heather B. Armstrong. Welcome to the Same 24 Hours Podcast with Meredith Atwood. We all have the same 24 hours each day, and it's what we do with those hours that makes all the difference between our health, happiness, and success. everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Same 24 Hours Podcast. I'm your host, Meredith Atwood. Today's guest is Heather B. Armstrong. Hi, Heather. Hi, how are you? Hi, I'm super. Doing well here in Kansas. In Kansas. (laughs) (laughs) Now, where are you? Um, I'm living in Salt Lake City, but when I heard your accent, uh, and I recognized it as being from the South because I'm originally from Tennessee. Okay. Yeah. I feel like I've gotten more Southern since I've moved to Kansas. <laughs> I don't understand, but I was listening to myself the other day, and it was really Southern. Yeah, all of my family lives out here in Salt Lake, and they are very, 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 very Southern. And so when I get around them, I start to chew my words. and <laughs> <laughs> That's what it's called, chewing your words. But I, don't, I just work from home, and I don't like leave the house at all. And so, mm-hmm. why am I chewing my words? Because no one talked to me. <laughs> anyway, so how long did you live in Tennessee? I was born and raised there. I left at 18 to go to college. Oh, um, I heard it then. 18 to go to college. 18 to go to college. And then I left and came to Utah. Um, and my sister had been here. My brother had been here. And all three of us, when we came out west, um, loved um, it's just different. It's very, very, very different. It's a different vibe and culture and scenery. And so when we went back to West Tennessee, it was like, oh, what are we doing? No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we all three came in to live in Utah, which, and then my parents were like, well, what are we doing? So both of my parents moved out to Utah. So I think a lot of my listeners will know who you are, but let's do a very quick rewind of the story. You're probably so sick of telling, but um, you're, <laughs> you, know, you can just like play it for, you know, hold on, yeah. let me get it off my phone, play and then go on. But <laughs> for people that don't know where you came from and kind of the, I think the last few years are actually your most interesting. Um, not that you weren't boring before, but kind of where this all took you has been fairly interesting. So give us the quick recap of, of deuce.com and, and parenting and <laughs> really quickly crap. Um, I <laughs> started my website in February of 2001, I just turned 18 years old. It was 2001 and I hand coded the website and I uploaded it by FTP to a server in Indiana. And I was writing about life as a single woman in Los Angeles and ended up getting fired for it because somebody found out that I was writing about my workplace and sent it to all my bosses. And uh, at that time, though, nobody knew what a blog was. Right. Um, And so I didn't think that anybody would ever read it. And um, that's when it sort of blew up. That was the first time it got a a major audience because I was one of the first people to ever be disciplined um, for something that I had done online. Mm. And actually, the term deuce became a verb. To be deuced was to get in trouble for something you've done online. And it, <laughs> it's a question <laughs> in Trivial Pursuit, and it was on Jeopardy as well. Oh, my gosh. And that's yeah. D-O-O-C-E for those yes. of you who don't Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's and, uh, funny. You made it to Alex Trebek. 
I did. How did you find out about that? <laughs> somebody, um, like somebody on the East Coast saw it that day and wrote an email and was like, oh my God, you're on Jeopardy. <laughs> and then, like, so I watched it that night and recorded it and I was just like stunned to hear him say my name. Crazy. So, yeah. So, oh, oh, what was the question? The question was, uh, a blog by Heather B. Armstrong created this term, um, which means to be uh, fired wow. from your job. So you got your, your name in there. So yeah. it wasn't just the term. Oh, yeah. man. So That's pretty major. It was a big day. And um, very proud. Very proud moment. <laughs> <laughs> I may not be on Jeopardy, but I'm in Jeopardy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cool. And from there... Um, I don't know, like it had to, and then my family found my website. Oh, isn't that the worst? Yeah. I didn't, I didn't even think that like they could barely log into their email at the time. So I was like, they're never going to read this. <laughs> and like, I was making fun of my family and oh, yeah. that's what we do. We're Southern. Right. We're, and and I, they just, and well, they, re- they really didn't care about what I had written about them. It was writing about this sinful activity that I was engaging in as a former Mormon. And Uh, they realized that I wasn't going through a phase that I actually had left the church. Well, how do you deal with that? How do you deal with parental disappointment? I think it's, it's interesting how many different personality types deal with what I have a real trouble, like disappointing people. It's just a fundamental character flaw. Are you just able to be like, eh, Oh God, no, no, I'm I'm, like, I am like a people pleaser. Mm -hmm. I avoid conflict. I want people to be happy. I will do anything. Um, (laughs) Like I joke about it. Like if you pee in my Cheerios, I'll be like, oh my God, what is wrong with your day? I'll help you out. (laughs) (laughs) I've noticed that about you on Instagram. (laughs) Like when someone will be like, oh, I actually came across I don't know. I was looking at it today and I forget which post it was, but it was because someone follows me and they commented on you and I guess it just fed it to me. Uh But it said something like, well, your life is always looks like a car crash (laughs) or something. (laughs) I was like, oh my God, I know this woman because she used to say the same thing to me. And, um, and and the way you responded, it was very much trying to like, bring her around, you know, like, well, yeah, my life's hard. So it is kind of like a car crash, (laughs) (laughs) but I totally, but that's hard to do to be a people pleaser in your space. I mean, it's got to wear on you. Yeah. That's been the most difficult part, I think. Um, And I haven't, I have not handled it well and I was never sort of guided and I, I had no mentor when it came to the criticism and the scrutiny. And I wish I had, I mean, I wish I, could provide that for people. Um, I was actually thinking about this yesterday um, when Chelsea Clinton was, uh, I don't know if you saw the video, but someone started screaming at Chelsea Clinton um, about her rhetoric being one of the causes for what happened in New Zealand over the weekend. Oh, I didn't see that. And um, I, I, I think that there is a market for somebody to study like tactical, um, uh, how do you uh, you de-escalate and to, to like get public figures and people who are who face this kind of scrutiny to figure out how to de-escalate a situation um and i was never taught i had, was never given any tools to deal with just the crazy 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 <laughs> amount of hate yeah and crazy <laughs> people i mean yeah yeah and and i mean I've been, I'm not, I'm like 10% as successful as you are in the blog space, but I notice how you have to learn these things the hard way. Cause I guess I started writing online about 2007, which I think is like six years after you started. Mm -hmm. I actually had a platform of blogger. I didn't have to write my HTML. So that was nice (laughs) like create it. I mean, you've got to be like looking around thinking, Oh my gosh, it's so easy to get a website now these days Yes, after you did it the hard way. But I feel like some of us have to go through it and kind of pave the way and learn the hard way. Um, I feel like I don't respond as much Mm -hmm. or, I mean, do you feel like you respond less or you're just a little easier, breezier in your response? Like how has it evolved from say 10 years ago when some idiot would say something 
on Facebook, for example? Well, like there's a, I, I approach it several ways. Um, you have to realize it's not about you. It's about them. They have something going on in their lives and they're taking it out on you. And they're taking, so they're taking it out on me. And I realize that. And I either respond with, you know, I'm, I am so sorry that whatever has happened is causing you to say this to me. And I wish you well. Um, that usually or, makes them matter, doesn't it? Well, you know, sometimes actually when I approach it that way, and they step back and they're like, oh, my God, I can't believe I did this. Like mm. people have I've, I've gotten that response a lot. Like, oh, you know what? I, I really was having a bad day and I apologize and thank you for listening to me. Um, and then sometimes I just don't respond because why am I going to waste my energy on them when I should be responding to people who are supporting what I'm doing? Mm-hmm. Um and sometimes, like, like with that comment, you know, your life is a train wreck, and it always seems like a car crash. And I was like, well, I mean, have you ever raised two kids alone and worked a full-time job and been responsible for all the financial and emotional well-being of two children and moved four times in four years? Um, <laughs> and then she answered you. She was like, yes, yeah. no, no, yes, no. <laughs> <laughs> thought oh boy and i said car crash is an is a is understatement an understatement See, you remember that comment yeah See? i totally it's do so funny yeah and i well, actually i actually <laughs> i'm just laughing my ass off but i actually like composed one because i know this person and i met her in person <laughs> and she was super nice in person and i thought wait a minute is this the same person i'm thinking of because they wouldn't be this nice in person mm-hmm. um, but i like composed this whole thing like in response and i thought this is just stupid i'm wasting my time getting involved yeah. in heather stuff <laughs> just because i was looking at her instagram because i'm about to interview her like, this is the definition of internet insanity I'm, I'm, on it. I'm in the middle of it but i think what it is too somehow bloggers and people that are in the public and we're sh- you're sharing your complete truth, your life and all the car crashedness that it is, but somehow mm-hmm. you're holding up a mirror to people. Yes. And they exactly. don't like it. They don't like it. And they don't like, um, it, I call it being deliberately misunderstood and like, like, Oh my God, Heather thinks that she's the only person who's ever been a full-time single mom. And it's like, actually, no, that's not what I'm trying to like. That's not my message. My message is I'm here for all the parents who struggle and who fight to make it through the day. And we all do. Mm -hmm. And doing it alone is especially hard. And um, I mean, so I've been blogging about parenthood since 2004. Um, And of course, I've gotten the criticism that I've violated my children's privacy and I've completely screw them up for life and i am oh god i once got accused of um munchausen by proxy oh no oh yeah oh yeah um my daughter didn't walk for until she was over two years old and had a lot of occupational therapy and someone wrote this manifesto on their own website about how i was like mistreating my child to get attention on my website Wow. And like I, that was a devastating day because it was like, why would someone say that? I, like I didn't understand like why someone would say that when they don't have in, they they really don't know me. Right. Um, they know what I write. Time. Take yeah. the time out of their day to write a manifesto. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> manifestos are hard. <laughs> I want that time. I want that right. kind of time. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> yeah. So was that your youngest daughter? That's my older daughter. My oldest, okay. She was born in 2004. Okay. Yeah. So how has parenting in the public eye been difficult? Um, it's been difficult only in the sense that people, you know, I share like 5% really of, the, of what goes on in my life. And people take that 5% and they extrapolate it and they make judgments about me as a mother. And most of it's really good. I mean, people, my whole thing is, again, to commiserate and talk about the difficulties because it is hard. And I, th- being able to laugh about it and to find the humor in the difficulty, I think, is very therapeutic and helps us get through the day. And um, people have, you know, been really, really um, 
hard on choices that I've made. And, you know, I've, I've been learning this whole thing as I, as I go along as well. I mean, like I said, I didn't have a mentor. I just sort of made all of this up as I went along. Right. And it's hard parenting when you don't really have a parenting mentor either. Not to say like our parents aren't mentors in a way, but we really need gurus. <laughs> you know, like where are those people when you are holding your baby for the first time that swoop in and say, this is what you should do. Yeah. <laughs> It'll be okay. Exactly. And, and I, I didn't have many friends with kids. And mm-hmm. so I was very isolated and alone and, you know, I had really terrible postpartum with my first kid and ended up in the hospital because I, I didn't sleep for six months. She was colicky and she didn't walk and it was, it was really, really bad. Do you ever recover from that sleep deprivation? Cause I don't think you can. I don't think you can. I don't think that you ever as a parent really, really get into a deep sleep <laughs> I know, ever again, ever again, because your brain, a part of your brain is always turned on and it's like, where are my children? Right. Are they safe? And like, that's not something that you understand until you have a kid and you're like, Oh my God, I'm never going to be able to sleep again. <laughs> it's true. It's true. And you mentioned like being a single mom, my husband's back and forth to Massachusetts right now. So I'm like a single mom five days a week. Oh. And so I, I usually sleep with earplugs in when he's here. <laughs> and so when he's gone, I sleep with one earplug. <laughs> Like, how dumb is that? But I feel like I need to kind of tune out, but also hear. Yes, I love that. The psychological idiocy of me going to bed with an eye mask and one earplug. (laughs) It's parenting, though. You have one ear, but like one ear closed just in case. Like, I want to pretend like I'm not listening to you. Exactly. (laughs) But you don't. You never never release that. You never relax again. Yeah. (laughs) Good luck, people out there having kids. Exactly. You're, you're sort of, well, ex- especially with our personality types, you're sort of turned, you're turned on mm-hmm. and you can't really turn it off because th- those kids are your responsibility and you can't lose them. And <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can, but then you'll really be hated. And it, and as a single mom, I was, I was trying to explain this to somebody over the weekend um, because somebody interviewed me about a book that I just wrote and um I, and in it, like I, I got really, 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 really depressed um, I, from running a marathon and raising two kids by myself. Their father moved across the country and I was by myself and I had, I was, I'm running my own business. So I'm working full time, meaning I'm working probably 60 to 70 hours a week. And I'm trying to like raise two daughters by myself. And it was really, really, really hard. And I was trying to explain to someone why I kept repeating in the book full-time single parent who works full-time and what you have to do to compartmentalize your own emotion and your own problems in order to provide the emotional support that your kids need is really, really exhausting. When you don't have someone, you can't say to someone, can you please go calm her down so that I can deal with, you know, this crisis over here. You have to, you have to like leave the crisis and go provide the emotional support for your child that you need. Right. And it's exhausting because it's relentless. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> and do you feel like the, the clock, t- to me, the clock, once it gets to about 2.30 and I realize that I have exactly an hour and 20 minutes or whatever left of my day, you know, because you can say, oh, but, you, you know, you have all night. But you don't. Like, the second kids walk in the door, it, you don't know what's happening. Like, it could be one of those nights where you get to work, or it could be, you know, they, they shit on the carpet, and then they ran through the house with it. Like, you don't know. And so I try to explain this to my husband, who's like, well, they're in school all day. You know, I'm like, you don't understand. Like, you, when they walk in the door, it could be a nuclear war. I was just going to use the word nuclear. I will... <laughs> I, I'm usually standing in the kitchen when my 15 year old walks in the door and I brace, I like I hold on to the countertop. I'm like, what is going to happen? And sometimes she walks in and a blast exerts from her body and like, like, <laughs> like decimates the room. And I'm like, Oh, okay. This is what our night's going to be. 
and, <laughs> and it's homework and piano and dinner and then more homework. And then, you know, there's just so much at night that by the end, when they're in bed, it's like, I can't do anything <laughs> to, to sit. <laughs> Yeah, I need to sit and nobody say anything. Nobody touch me. Just let me. <laughs> he feels like you've been beaten. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, doing math with my uh. he's 11, and he's he knows just how to make me lose it. And <laughs> he does it on purpose. I call him serial killer eyes because he looks at me, and I keep thinking, Jeffrey Dahmer was such a nice young man. You know, like he's got those like serial killer eyes where everyone's, going to say he was a great kid but then on a murderous rampage and i'll get shat on for saying that but um you know he knows how to push my buttons and i can only take so much yeah like, what is your breaking point you have do you have two teenagers or one teenager I have and one coming 15 year old and a nine-year-old okay and that nine-year-old knows how to push my buttons and when she's doing her math homework that's when her legs start to hurt oh my gosh <laughs> My 10-year-old has a growing leg, too. Uh, <laughs> with the legs hurting. I, I, I had growing pains, too, but I never used it to get out of math homework. No, we've had a leg hurt since age five. <laughs> my daughter. That's funny. Right? She's just like, she's like, oh, oh my legs. And I'm like, just get the, get the problem done. That's all you have to do. <laughs> Your legs have nothing to do with the vision. <laughs> That's so funny because I just I just texted my husband this morning and I said, "Hope you slept well." Stella came in my room last night. Her legs hurt. Eye roll, eye roll emoji. <laughs> because she's got you know, and you know, I fear that maybe there is something wrong with her leg. No, I so growing pains are growing pains are a real thing, and my daughter uses it to get out of math homework. And then when she has to practice piano every day, she when she sits down. At the piano, her legs are like, and she starts to like moan, and then she falls on the floor, oh. and it's a deal. And so, and her piano teacher, which she sees once a week, says, You know, you have a very different daughter than what I see in the lesson. <laughs> and, and, and apparently, at this last lesson, she was just really frustrated, and she told the teacher that she couldn't play because her legs were hurting. <laughs> I'm going to need to introduce, is it Marlo, Marlo yeah. and Stella? And they should just start their own podcast. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. So. They're, yeah. They're long lost. They're missing sisters. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so how is parenting a teenager? Um, Not like talking about, you know, I don't want to get you in Instagram hell, but that, you know how it is. Oh, no. Give me, um, some, it, give me some, be my guru, Heather. Oh, man. So people had warned me, and, and this is the thing. I was not the teenager that my teenager is. I was, and, and it's good that she's, her, her emotions are outward. She displays her emotions, and she talks about her emotions, and her emotions are, like, she wears them, like, on her body. I was very inward. I was, uh, I turned everything. I didn't talk about it. All of my depression, because I was seriously depressed as a teenager. I just sort of like absorbed it and never inflicted it on my mom. And um, my daughter's very different. She's very outward. She wants me to know about how she's <laughs> healing. And it is, it is exhausting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love her. She's the most amazing kid who ever lived. I've done a, I, I, I'm going to take credit for how amazing <laughs> she is. Um, but it really is. Uh, it's different than, than a toddler, but it's just as exhausting. Wow. Thanks. And very <laughs> I'm so excited. <laughs> what, what does it feel like to raise a human though? Like knowing that she's out in the world in what, three or four years. Do you, do you panic and think, have I done everything I was supposed to do? Does she have yeah. all the tools? Is she emotionally stable? Like, cause I'm, I'm, I've dealt with depression too, not to the extent you have, but I, I don't want my kids to have to feel that way. My, my big thing was addiction. So I was a drunk and I'm three years sober. And so oh, wow. I, I keep looking at them and I'm like, are they going to be drunks? <laughs> <You know? laughs> <laughs> don't don't drink and they're like what's drinking we're 10 you know but, um yeah what is that what, do, what goes through your head right it's um i think she's very independent 
um, and is a, very excited to go out into the world. She wants a lot of kids her age do not want to get driver's license. Really? This is, is a, a thing. Millenni- Wait, what are they? They're not millennials, are they're, they? They're they're like Generation Z or Y. Yeah. Hmm. A lot of kids her age are just, mm, you know, they are, their mom will drive them or they'll get a Lyft account. And, you know, it's she wants a driver's license. She wants a car. She wants to get away. And she has she actually sat me down and said, we need to have a talk. <laughs> and I, I need to know that you're going to be okay when I leave. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, no, of course I am. Get out of here. <laughs> she wants to go to college somewhere else and uh she doesn't want to stay in utah she wants to stay in utah for high school and then she wants to get out mm-hmm. and she's very independent that way and I'm, i feel very confident that she's going to have the tools what i think about is like so what i entered the world without any sort of sex education whatsoever uh-huh. and i entered the world without any sort of political education and um race education and a lot of things that she's going to come up against. And I'm wondering, like, am I having enough conversations with her about those things? Yeah. Um, especially the sex education part of it. Yeah. Yeah. I gave my kids books recently. Oh, you did? Yeah. And and then my son told his friend, he's like, I got a book. And his friend was like, about penises? I got one of those for Christmas. <laughs> I was like, oh, good. I'm not the only one who's doing that. But I, you know, I don't want to make it awkward for them, but I don't know. I, I just, my son likes facts. And so I thought, you know, he likes facts. He, he, he has a book called A Thousand Facts. And I thought he will like a book about facts. About facts. <laughs> <laughs> and then my daughter, I got her The Care and Keeping of You, like that highly rated, high, you know, renowned book on Amazon. And she picked it up and she was like, oh, I know about periods, whatever. And she just threw it. And I thought, well, you know, I got this one right. (laughs) That's amazing. My parents didn't talk. We didn't talk about that. You were supposed to be a virgin. End of story. End of story. End of story. And so I went out into the world and had no idea what was going on. I had no clue what was going on. I actually write about this in my book. And I'm not, I have no, like, I'm not embarrassed to even write, to say it, but, like, I'm prone to UTIs. I'm prone to urinary tract infections after sex. Mm-hmm. And nobody told me that this was a thing. Right. Like, no, nobody told me that you can, this, this is a phenomenon. And even, I didn't even know what a urinary tract infection was. And I got one the first time I had sex. And I had no idea what was going on. And I was screaming. And my roommate at the time came in and she's like oh you must have a uti and i was like what is that like a ufo like (laughs) what are you talking about i had no idea right and i wish that like my mom had pulled me aside and gone with me to the gynecologist and you know i'm gonna do all of that with her yeah and i think you know that's that's the right thing to do i think as long as we're trying to communicate and Mm -hmm. um you know, Stella's like, I think I'm going through puberty. And I was like, oh, yeah. And so she'll tell me, like, all the changes that are that are happening to her that are indicating so. <laughs> and then she'll make up some. And I'm like, yeah, that's not one. But, you know, it's it's like we're talking about it. And so I feel better already. You know, yeah, oh, I bought them books. And that's kind of shitty, maybe. It's a parent. But I just want them to have the resource. <laughs> <laughs> and then I've noticed my son, when he hugs me now, like, he used to just give me a full boob hug and now he kind of goes for the shoulder you know? <laughs> and so i ruined that the innocence is gone <laughs> oh and the innocence is gone oh yeah yeah so let's talk about your book my book this, okay so this is book number is this four yeah officially it's four but i sort of like to consider it my second book oh <laughs> why is that <laughs> you want to forget about two of them well the first one i had to write it's a compilation of essays about fatherhood and I had to do that book to get out of a lawsuit. Um, yeah, that was a uh, so, that was a dark chapter of my life. Um, and uh, they sued me because I didn't sign the contract. And they sued to make me sign the contract, which you think is not something that you can sue for. But apparently in New York, there's some precedent for it. So Wow. Nothing um, like being forced to write a book you don't want right? to write. 
<sighs> right? Wow. <laughs> How did you even, that's amazing. Yeah, that was a, that was like a very scary two months of my life. Cause I thought I was going to lose everything. Oh my gosh. Um, okay. So we won't talk about that, but yeah. moving on next book. <laughs> next book is about my postpartum depression with my daughter um, and how I checked myself into a hospital and got better. Um, the third oh, book. You, you were still married at the time? Yes, I was yeah. still married. Uh, that was 10 years ago. It was 2009 when it was released. And um, and then I used to write my, my older daughter. I used to write her a, a monthly newsletter to talk about her and what her like the changes in her life. And I did that for five years. And then realized it was just too much to keep up. And <laughs> it's like the first kid gets a five-year baby book. And I mean, it's perfect. Yeah. And I had an editor who compiled all of it and put it into a very family-friendly. He took out all of the, the swearing and, um, <laughs> and compiled it into like a, a Mother's Day book. Oh, that's um, nice. But it, it came out as I was going through my divorce. And I just, I just, you know, I was sort of consumed with the tragedy of that and um and it was a lot of the tragedy was that it was so public and like the huffington post wrote about it the new york times wrote about it the local paper wrote about it um it got picked up because the mommy blogger got divorced and she's not supposed to get divorced and it was a really really horrific experience Um, why why did i don't even know where to go with that i mean so many people get divorced yeah. Why was it such a fascinating event, do you think? Because I, one, I was the mommy blogger, and I had made our life and our marriage look like we were, um, we, we really fit together. And I always made fun of me in, in relation to him, like he had to put up with me. Mm-hmm. Um, that's how I sort of let, let the steam off of any of our problems was to say, oh yeah, he has to deal with a crazy person. Right. So I made my own bed. Like I, I portrayed me as the person who was crazy. And, um, so when it happened, people were just like, oh my gosh, he had to deal with her for 10 years. And, um, yeah. Yeah. So what, what would you do differently? Not as far as your marriage, but as far as portraying yourself in a blog? Um, I have kept my relationships out of my writing. Um, I, I wrote about my new, my newest partner, my newest, <laughs> as if it's going to change. It's not going to change. Um, I wrote about him just, I had a painting done for his birthday and sort of finally came out and said, this is, this is the person that I'm living with. And this was the train wreck post. This is where someone said you were a car crash. Yeah. It's the mm-hmm. same post. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a loving, nice tribute post. Okay. <laughs> Just noted that. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I keep him and his children out of my writing. I just don't want to bring that into um, the conversation anymore um, because I living through a public divorce like that, it's yeah. Uh, that's yeah. something to leave. It's, that's a, a tip I would give to people is leave that part out of your writing. And I used to write a lot about my children and my husband, who his nickname on the blog was the expert and everyone knew about him. And then Mm -hmm. I, we had a huge blowout and he was like, you keep me off your stupid blog. And this was like 2013. (laughs) And so I just like, "Er," I pulled it all back and I barely mentioned him. And so then I start hearing, well, they're getting a divorce. She doesn't talk about him. He's never around. And he's like, keep me off your Instagram. And I'm like, (sighs) done. And so he's never on my Instagram, but it's so funny because now I've been hearing for years that I'm getting divorced and I'm, it's always news to me. <laughs> oh my God. But yeah, right? I mean, I think that would be my advice too, is like, don't let anyone know about them. <laughs> <laughs> it, or it, and just keep it minimal. And I like, I don't want to write about our dynamic and cause that's, you know, it's sacred to me now. Like I realize just how sacred it is mm-hmm. and inviting people into the conversation about it is really unhealthy. Right. Because they form opinions off of the 5% you shared. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about the second slash fourth book, um, The Valedictorian of Being Dead 
the true story of dying 10 times to live. What does that mean? I do know you were valedictorian of your class. <laughs> I was a valedictorian of my high school. Yes. Um, and that I, has carried you far. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Everybody cares about that. <laughs> right. It's on your card. <laughs> Heather Armstrong, valedictorian. Um, uh, but really, what does that do to a kid? What is valedictorian? What did it mean for you then? And how did it haunt you? Or did it? Oh, my, my, oh, well, it's, I write extensively about it in my book. I was, um, you know, I was basically born to make my mother happy. And I spent my entire childhood, like, attempting to get the best grades possible, because if I did that, then she would be happy. And, um, like, being the valedictorian for me was the ultimate goal in life as a kid, and if anybody told me to calm down or, like, it's not a big deal or, like, getting a B is going to be okay, I would scratch their faces off. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, sounds familiar. Yeah. And I, in, so my daughter is showing the same tendencies. And she hates it when people say getting an A minus is not a big deal. And so I have to be very cautious how I talk to her because when I say – can I tell you how unhappy I was? It, I was so unhappy and get, being valedictorian did nothing for me in life. <laughs> yeah. Other than the fact that it's on a plaque downstairs in a box. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, um, I underwent a, uh, an experimental study for, um, treatment resistant depression. Treatment and, resistant depression. Okay. Yeah. So basically like people who tried several different, methods of getting trying to get better um whether it's like medical or medicinal or or you know you've done everything that you possibly can and the thing is working there are options for you um and this this uh experiment is trying to replicate ect and without the side effects of ect and i they basically give you an anesthetic and induce a coma so deep that it it basically quiets all of your brain activity and they keep you there for 15 minutes whoa yeah okay so you you did that i guess 10 times i did it 10 <laughs> times and they it, they literally came up with the idea off of like four or five different other studies and this is the first time they've ever used propofol this way and <clears throat> i was the third person to go through it and I went down the first time that I, that I went down, I went down so fast that they had to struggle to get the breathing tube into my body in time. Oh my and gosh. they, because they had no idea because the two people before me were slow to go down. And I just like, I was like, well, I want to be dead. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, I'm right there. I'm at the door. Yeah. I was like, please, please. And so wow. my, and, um, my mother was just like, oh, yeah, she's the best at everything she does. <laughs> <laughs> I need to introduce our mothers, too. <laughs> and so that's, that's where, where the title came from is um, my mother said to the doctor, you know, she's the valedictorian of being dead. Oh, so. that's funny. That's funny. Have you found, I want to pop back to the kids real quick. Have yeah. you found that your relationship to grades, are you a little lax because I went completely the opposite because I was very similar. I, I had all these expectations. I got in trouble if I got B's kind of stuff. And so I have kind of gone the, the other way with my kids. I'm like, eh, no one's going to look at your fifth grade transcript. Just pass, you know, <laughs> and my husband's like, my God, Meredith, they have to like learn. And I'm like, oh, they're fine. You know, I'm almost like a hippie when it comes to this stuff. I, is, that's what, yes, that's exactly where I am. Yeah. That's exactly how I but am. I don't know like, if that's good either, right? Well, like my, my they're motive, like well, if the, my older one is at least motivated. She gets great grades. She's so hard on herself, and I'm just like, and I always like look at her and go, you know that I understand how you feel, right? Like I'm the one person in the world who understands how important this is to you. I'm also the one person in the world who can tell you that it's okay. Yeah, yeah. And I really want her to enjoy being a teenager. Yeah, we're so. trying to be the. the- parent that we needed or mm -hmm. yeah and we'll screw it up we're not doing it right but yeah know, they'll talk about us on a podcast someday but anyway okay <laughs> so back to being the val valedictorian of being dead 
what did it so let's talk about your depression you said you were depressed as a teenager so this has been a lifelong cloud yes i've struggled i've struggled my entire life it's it is rampant in my family um far and wide depression has affected my family and um my mother is one of 10 kids and she's the only one who didn't suffer from depression um, me and my brother suffer. My sister does not, but two of three of her kids do. Um, three of my brother's kids do. My children do. Um, it is. I have. I have episodes, and you know, sometimes coming out of an episode is easier than other times. Um, and I got into a depression so deep that I it got worse and worse and worse and worse, and it was just a deep, deep spiral. And I, nothing was working to bring me out of it. And I was really scared. I was very, very scared that I was always going to feel that way for the rest of my life. And so I went to see my psychiatrist only to get a refill on a medication. And I didn't want to see him because I knew that if I saw him, he would know how bad I felt. Oh, yeah. And medical professionals are required to, you know, be extraordinarily circumspect when you say certain things. Right. And I didn't want him to know. And I sat down across from him and he's like, you don't even have to say a word to me. I know exactly how you're feeling. And, um, and he said, I, and I'm glad you're sitting here because I have, I have an idea for you. And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> how long had this particular episode lasted at this point? It was over 18 months. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, it was bad. Um, and it all started when, I mean, I changed my diet to be vegan, and then I trained for a marathon and was raising my kids by myself and <laughs> working full time. And <laughs> So you were saying you were very full and energized. Got it. Yeah. I, wow. basically, I dug my hole, man. I just, whew, it was bad. Deep, dark fatigue deep dark and i and i thought that when i finished the marathon i'd feel better and no not at all no maybe you just needed one earplug <laughs> and an eye mask yes an eye mask. <laughs> okay yeah. so he presented you with this treatment what did you think initially i was scared that he was going to suggest ect that's no, what so I was what is ECT? Of. So ECT is electroconvulsive uh, therapy. Convulsive. I couldn't get the T. I was like, electrotherapy? Yeah. Cat therapy. They hook, they hook you up and they shock the brain into a okay. seizure. Oh. Um, yeah, and you have to do it like 10 to 12 times. And you suffer, you can suffer uh, permanent memory loss and temporary memory loss and uh, severe headaches, migraines, um, ongoing and so the side effects are are bad, but the therapy actually really works for treatment resistant depression. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's like, you know, we've got a doctor here who's amazing, and he's using an anesthesia, and you'll be able to go about your normal life, and you're not going to suffer any side effects. I think you should do it. I know it's going to work. Trust me. Yes, there's a possibility of death. You're not going to die, but it's, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> and um so i it was the first time in 18 months honestly when he told me about it that i was like i might maybe i won't feel like this forever and <clears throat> so i went home and called my mom and i said you know what do you want to do and she's like are you kidding me let's do this wow so because she knew how bad you were oh yeah oh yeah <laughs> now how is it having a relationship with with a mom who's not depressed i mean is there just a disconnect and understanding no in no. fact in fact so i was the first kid really to ask for help and she saw the signs in me and mm-hmm. she's actually really grateful for what i've written and, and how i talk about it and what i've done because we can now recognize the signs and all the grandchildren and get them help immediately instead wow. of like living in in pain and my, yeah. my mother is the hugest, like, um, advocate for mental health awareness. Um, and she sees how, to, how, how me and my brother have suffered and how grandchildren have suffered. And she does everything she possibly can to support it. That's awesome. Yeah. 
So what happened? Like, let's talk about you had this done 10 times. Like, give us the I mean, obviously, we want people to read the book. But what what happened? <laughs> <laughs> Tell us what happened. Yeah, right? so it, it was basically every other day for four, three weeks, three or four weeks. I had to go in every other day and you have to fast. So I was fasting for 20 hours at a time, three times a week. And my mother and stepfather drove me there every time and watched it every time. And, um, which was a very harrowing experience for my mother. Um, sure. Yeah. And everybody who's read the book says that my mom, if if they make a movie out of it, my mother will be the star of the movie. (laughs) Who's going to play her? (laughs) Oh man. The only, she has such a, your mom, what does she look like? She's, she's, she's beautiful. She's 70. Oh, she's 73 years old. And she has an incredible duality to her because she's very religious. Um, And like she is extraordinarily business minded, very smart, but she can be super crass and (laughs) irreverent. Um, Susan Sarandon, Glenn Close. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Yeah, Glenn Close would be great. Um, so yeah, she, she's, um, she saved my life. Honestly, she dedicated her life, a month of her life to me. And, <clears throat> you know, after the first few treatments, I didn't feel anything and was sort of getting even more depressed because like, what am I doing? I'm and, hungry. I'm, I'm hungry. so hungry. <laughs> <laughs> and then the fifth treatment I, happened two years ago yesterday on on St. Patrick's Day and after the fifth treatment something happened um it was like I call it a switch got flipped Mm -hmm. and suddenly all of a sudden literally suddenly I didn't want to be dead anymore wow yeah and so you had five more after that Mm -hmm. and and that's that's the treatment Mm -hmm. yeah yeah, and they, they're they replicating ECT, and because you have to do 10 to 12 treatments of ECT, they want to, like, prove that this is how it works. So is the study done as far as... They did, they did 10 of us in that, in, that, um, in that treatment, and now in a month they're starting the double-blind study, which wow. involves, I think, 22 people. Yeah. Wow. So half of them will get it and then half of them won't. So what's going to happen to them? They just go to sleep? Yeah. Just... Yeah. They'll be given propofol, but not enough to do to the brain what they did to my brain. That would make me mad. <laughs> you know what? I don't get to eat and I don't feel better. Yeah. So the uh, lead anesthesiologist on the study who helped come up with the study, um, he and I are good friends now and he's actually going to be speaking um, at the Salt Lake book tour, we're going to do a Q and a with him. And I sat down, um, to have coffee with him the other day. And he said, you know, it, it just pains me that we have to do a double blind. Like it, he goes, it destroys me because this is so needed and it works. And half of these people are not going to get the effect. And he said, it just, he's like, he's like, I'm a scientist, I'm a doctor. And that really makes me sad. So um, yeah, Damn I mean, science, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's required in order to get this approved. No, I'm <sighs> married to one. He's the expert. <laughs> yes, I mean, and because he is always telling me anytime I start anything new, you know, I'm like, well, I feel better because I changed this, this, and this, and this. And he's like, God, you have no idea. You have no control. You know, like the control <laughs> of the study. And I'm like, geez, I don't. But yeah, I have no regard for science. I feel like you do. Give them, give it all to them. If they all feel better, it worked. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's simple math. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so how how do you feel? I mean, it, you said it's two years from mm-hmm. treatment five, so almost two years since it was complete. Yeah, um, I feel I feel really good. Uh, my life is, and I write this in the in the afterward. Like, I, my life is more chaotic than it's ever been. You know, I thought that moving in with someone was going <laughs> to, I thought, I thought that was going to calm things down and whoa, did my life explode? And it's, my life is as chaotic as it has ever been. And, um, and I'm handling it. Like I'm totally okay. I can, I have bad days, but, um, 
I'm so much better. Yeah. And, and, and that is because I take all of my medication every day. And that's very important. And, and they emphasize this when you're done with the study. Like, you have to stay on your medication to stay well. So. What does depression feel like? Like, the deep, dark depression you experienced for 18 months. You said you didn't want to live. But what, what are some words that you've used to describe it? Um, it's an all-consuming um, sadness. I write about this because they give you a sheet of paper before you go into the treatment and they ask you about <clears throat> what is your general interest like and how do you feel about normal activities and how do you, what's your appetite like and how, what, how is your relationship with your family and how do you feel about yourself? And that question, I think, got to the heart. That one question was always like, it, w- it would punch me in the gut because I would see the question and the, the answers are, um, I feel okay about myself or I feel that I am unworthy or I feel like I br- am a burden to everyone else. I feel like there is no reason for me to exist. Mm. And um, I think that's what it is, is <clears throat> I was going to call the book um, better off without me. Um, because there's having that kind of depression makes, makes me, and I think it makes a lot of people feel like we are, uh, taking up space in people's lives that should be used for something else. Yeah. And we feel like we're a burden and that people would be just so much better not having to deal with us. And that's, that's the overall feeling I think. So your book is out April 23rd. April 23rd, yes. On Tuesday. It's got to be a Tuesday. I just yes. learned that all books come out on Tuesday. <laughs> I learned that with my last guest. Uh, I just had a book come out last Tuesday, and I was like, oh, it must be true. <laughs> yes. So, Heather, I appreciate talking with you. I've got one more question for you. Sure. Um, this podcast is called The Same 24 Hours, which means we all have the same 24 hours in our day, but it's what we do in those 24 hours that leads to our greatest health, happiness, and success. So I like to ask my guests, what is something that you do on a daily basis that you think helps you live your best life? We moved in with my partner and his kids back in August, and we live close enough to my kids' school that we walk every day. And it is a ritual that I absolutely adore because we walk our dog and I walk with my child and I get to, you know, walk her up to the door of her school. And, um, you know, when in, in the depths of my depression, waking up was one of the worst parts of my life. Right. And now I, I really enjoy the morning part of my day because of that walk with my kid. And so like, even, even when it's like snowing crazy outside, we walk to school because it just brings me so much joy. Yeah. Well, when she leaves the house, you can just like start a service, like kid walking, (laughs) you can can walk other people's kids. That's a great idea. (laughs) I know, isn't it? Yes. (laughs) Well, thank you, Heather. I appreciate your time. Thank you. It was great catching up with our lady of perpetual depression. (laughs) cracked me up. (laughs) on your blog <laughs> that was a criticism of me and i was like i love that it's perfect let's I make love it <laughs> <laughs> all right well thank you so much thank you i really appreciate it mm-hmm.